Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming uh, to our um, press briefing on the Army support to vaccine development. My name is Colonel Kathy Turner. I'm the director of the Army Media Relations Division, and I will moderate today's session. Uh, the following senior leaders will be on, are on today's panel. We have Brigadier General Mike Talley, Commanding General of U.S. Army Medical Research and Development Command in Fort Detrick. We have Colonel Wendy Sammons Jackson, Director of Military Infectious Disease Research Program, U.S. Army Medical Research and Development Command. We have Dr. Nelson Michael, Director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research, Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. And we have Dr. Kayvon Majrad, Director of Emerging Infectious Diseases, Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. Today's discussion is on the record. After Brigadier General Talley's opening remarks, I ask that you limit yourselves to one question and one follow-up until we have uh, gotten around the room, and then we'll continue to field questions until we're out of time. We have about 30 minutes today, um, and th with that, I'll turn it over to you, sir. Okay. Hey, good afternoon, and thank you for participating in today's briefing. Our hearts go out uh, to those that are affected or know someone who's affected by this disease. You know, emerging infectious diseases like uh, the, this coronavirus that we're facing now or COVID-19 or why a global network of military infectious disease surveillance laboratories exist around the world. Military medical research is a force multiplier designed to support the service member and the public in every conceivable circumstance. Through both emerging science and technological advances, the United States Army Medical Research and Development Command is on the forefront of delivering medical capabilities faster and more efficiently than ever before. We are supporting a whole of government approach to detect, prevent, and treat COVID-19. And when it comes to infectious disease threats, we have extensive capabilities and an international research infrastructure already in place that allows our scientists to anticipate and develop countermeasures against emerging infectious diseases. COVID-19 is the infection caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and this is familiar territory for our team. Our labs have previously studied SARS and MERS, uh, both of which are coronaviruses. They're in that same family. Our researchers and scientists at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research conducted the first inhuman phase one trials of the MERS vaccine. And that's the only MERS countermeasure and, the, the only, and only the third coronavirus vaccine ever tested in humans. We're building upon the science for COVID-19 solutions uh, as we speak right now. Uh, just this week, we were able to develop new versions of COVID-19 candidate, uh, one, of the, one of the first candidates that we've tried. And we initiated research to determine if there is a response to the vaccine. Again, we're, this is just one piece of the solution. There's other vaccine candidates being developed by other organizations, but we're all working toward a solution. And we want to get it done as quickly as possible, and we're doing uh, this in a whole of government fashion and certainly a whole of DOD fashion. In addition to vaccine prevention, we are also exploring treatments. Efforts are ongoing right now to identify new drug candidates to respond to the COVID-19 infection. A cooperative research and development agreement with an industry partner is under review for the DOD to gain access to an antiviral drug for treatment use in our medical centers, our military treatment facilities. So together with our United States government partners, we are progressing at uh, very uh, fast rates, uh, revolutionary rates almost, uh, uh, constant effort. Uh, and this is in order to deliver effective treatment and prevention products products that will protect the citizens of the world and preserve the readiness and lethality of our DOD's service members. I want to thank you in advance, uh, but I'd also like to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about, uh, about my teammates here. So Colonel uh, Dr. Uh, Wendy Sammons Jackson is the director for our military infectious disease portfolio. She dual hats as the joint program committee uh, director uh, for the entire DOD. So when you're looking at the, the capabilities and capacity within uh, the Medical Research and Development Command, uh, the demand signal is coming uh, from all over the Joint Forces. She's managed that portfolio uh, for the last uh, two years. And uh, when you talk about some of the uh, most recent accomplishments with MERS, 
uh, with, uh, with Zika. Uh, she, uh, she has been, uh, been involved in all of those things. Uh, Dr. Nelson Michael, uh, about 37 years of experience. Uh, same thing, we talk about uh, uh, some of our, our latest successes with MERS. Uh, both he and uh, Dr. Kayvon Mujarid have been uh, right at the forefront. Uh, and even with Zika, uh, very proud to say that within uh, nine months, uh, this is the team that, uh, that was able to uh, start the first inhuman clinical trials. Uh, and just uh, last December of 19, uh, the, uh, uh, the MERS uh, CoV, uh, correction, the uh, Ebola uh, Zaire version uh, vaccine was given uh, full FDA approval. Uh, these two gentlemen were, uh, uh, played, a, played a big part of that. Dr. Kayvon Martin, uh, again, uh, uh, having uh, been the scientist behind a patented adjuvant that's designed for uh, this, uh, this same family of diseases, um, it's an adjuvant that is, uh, that's being used right now, uh, being shared with our, with our whole of government partners. Uh, he just recently returned from uh, Switzerland. Uh, we were lucky enough to be able to uh, recruit him from the World Health Organization. And uh, he's uh, been back for about a week uh, from Switzerland. So when you look at uh, certainly the scientists that, uh, that we recruit and train uh, within the DOD, uh, they are well integrated uh, with, uh, with some of the top scientists in the country. And so we're very proud to take part in this effort, and we look forward to your questions. Okay. Anita? Hi, Lily Vidalgo with the Associated Press. Um, um, for whoever this most applies, um, just on the vaccine, um, can you talk a little bit, just more detail, about the vaccine, your work that's being worked on? Um, is, is it different than um, NIH's approach, and how soon are you to, for like a phase one trial, Absolutely. and then I'll just throw the follow-up out just in case um, that's easier. Um, the rapid diagnostic that is being worked on, um, can you talk a little bit about that and how, sort of where you are in the rapid diagnostic tool and how soon that might also be available for, um, for testing? Yes, ma'am. Let me, I'll, I'll, let me just take the first uh, two questions quickly and give you um, over to, to Dr. Majard who can talk about some more granular aspects of this vaccine. Um, first thing I just want, to, want um, you all to know is that we have been around the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research for 127 years. I mean, we are, a lot of people like to ask, well, why is the Army involved in vaccine development? We've been doing this for an extremely long period of time. Walter Reed obviously made um, his notoriety on figuring out countermeasures to yellow fever. So we've been doing this for an extremely long time. It's one. Two is that we work very closely in the interagency space. The, uh, my first Raider in the Army, I re recently retired, is uh, Bob Redfield, who's the CDC director. My second Raider is Debbie Burks, now obviously the Global AIDS coordinator and running uh, the COVID response under the vice president. And Dr. Fauci, I was close enough to him that he retired me about uh, 18 months ago. So we work very, very closely in the interagency space. And the vaccine that I'll let Dr. Majarid uh, talk about, we worked with Dr. Fauci's team to find a space where we could find a vaccine candidate that was scientifically not duplicative, but mutually supportive of what others were doing, um, but also made sense. And so we ended up moving on two different vaccine platforms um, in coordination with Dr. Fauci and his team. Um, let me let uh, Dr. Majara tell you a little bit more about that and what our, our rough timelines uh, could be. Thanks for your question. Uh, so. From the first day that the sequences of the new virus was, were published, we were working on this vaccine, and we were doing so in coordination with our interagency partners at the NIH, uh, specifically the Vaccine Research Center, where the president was visiting just a couple of days ago, and which uh, is the place that I came from, where I trained under Dr. John Mascola and Dr. Barney Graham there and uh, have been in constant communication, very much like we did for the Zika vaccine, where the NIH and Walter Reed Army Institute of Research had two complementary approaches towards a vaccine candidate for Zika. Here, again, we're taking a platform that actually has been used uh, in clinical trials so far for influenza, a different respiratory virus, um, and focusing uh, on a component of the virus that a lot of groups are working on, but with a unique platform and a unique what's called adjuvant, which is a 
um, a, a, a chemical that is used in combination with vaccines all the time to enhance their immune response. And that adjuvant is actually patented by the Army. Uh, so we see this as a unique and complementary approach that is non-duplicative, uh, that is um, being coordinated as part of the whole of government response. And, I mean, I, I know you asked a question about the point of, uh, of care testing. Um, unfortunately, we don't. I think we have the world's leading expert in infectious disease diagnostics. This just happens to be um, in the Army at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, Dr. Sheila Peel. Um, Sheila, like, like me, really isn't, has been working on HIV almost her whole uh, professional career, and there isn't a single HIV rapid test that's out in the market that hasn't at some level passed through her hands. And so she's really our lead for looking at the diagnostics uh, that are currently being used, the tests that would allow us to understand whether or not someone's infected or has been exposed. And I can tell you that, you know, for now, most of those tests are based on detecting the virus itself. So developing um, the kind of test, like a, like a pregnancy test that, that you might be a, a familiar with, is requiring a different kind of technology. Sheila is, is, is already having those kinds of discussions. Um, I think what you're going to probably see is much more sophisticated and higher throughput tests that initially would be done in more sophisticated laboratories. And then as time goes on, that technology will then roll out to establish platforms to allow these tests to be used more at the point of care. But, I mean, do you have a sense on when, um, when you'll have a test ready to roll out? Do you have a sense of any timing on that? And do you have a sense on whether this vaccine, when that would be, or have you started testing in animals or, or have you the phase one trial? Do you have timing? Okay. So, so as far as the diagnostics are concerned, um, there are large and very competent commercial concerns that are looking literally in the next month or two to be able to take to convert the current assays that are really um, uh, relatively slow to execute and can you only do a small number of samples at a time to being able to do these on very robust machines that could execute up to 800 tests per eight hours which is a standard work shift so those are the kinds of, of approaches that the the, um, the industry has already done I mean I mean we do HIV testing we do almost a million HIV tests a year at our, uh, at our laboratory up in Silver Spring, and we use those kinds of instruments. So they can be adapted uh, for those kinds of other technologies. Um, let me let uh, Dr. Majarid talk about the, where we are in terms of stages of development preclinically then into the clinic for a vaccine. So if we think about vaccine development at different stages, the first stage is the design and the discovery mm -hmm. to decide what is going to be your candidate. We've completed that. And uh, we have gone into small animals, mice. So we're looking at what the response is to that vaccine in mice. And then as far as a timeline to get in, into humans, I wouldn't want to speculate too much on that. I think the important thing to consider also is that going beyond a phase one study, there's uh, the second phase, which is oftentimes looking in a larger population at the safety and the immune response, but also then transitioning to see if it's effective in populations. What I think the field is trying to do is position itself as a whole so that if there's a second wave during the next season in the winter, that mm -hmm. those candidates have made it through phase one studies to be ready to look at the effectiveness during the next season. Okay, so let's go to Caitlin, and then we'll come over to Tara. Caitlin. Yeah, it's a question slash request. Um, with describing, like, the vaccine, um, can you be a little bit more broken down in, mm -hmm. in terms of language about what you're talking about? Because you're talking about candidates, which, what sure. does that mean? Okay. What does it mean for vaccine platforms? Just so that when people, so that we can communicate best about okay. what you're kind of mm -hmm. really talking yeah. about. Yeah, thank you. So think of this as the virus, my fist, you know, it's a sphere, <laughs> right? And it's got little spokes coming off of it. That makes it the corona. When you look at it on cross-section, it's got that crown look to it. So almost all the vaccine candidates out there are focused on that little spoke, what we call the spike, the spike protein. And there are different parts of the spike that mediate the attachment of the virus and the entry of the virus into our cells in our lungs. So if you block that attachment, if you give a vaccine that trains and educates your immune response, your immune system, 
to recognize that part of the pr virus that attaches to your cells and blocks it, that's gonna be a good vaccine. So that's why everybody's focused on that. So we are looking, and then so what's a candidate then? Candidate means that you're looking at options. You got your different options, that's your different candidates. And you look in mice or other animals, other people are looking at other animals as well as, as uh, our scientists are doing uh, within our command um, to see which of those options looks best in small animals and then larger animals before you go into humans. Mm -hmm. As far as a platform, so you have that little piece of the virus that is gonna be the part that educates your immune response, but you need to deliver it in something to the body. You need to get it expressed in your body, and there are different ways to do that. You can have it on a nanoparticle, basically a, 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 something, another sphere that kind of looks like the virus. You can have it in DNA, which is part of, you know, the same kind of DNA, but it goes into our body and our cells express that. The Moderna vaccine that you've probably heard about in collaboration with the NIH, that's mRNA, it's a different kind of thing like DNA. That's the platform part, it's the part that expresses that candidates that uh, we're trying to find out wh how good it is in different uh, animals. Hope that Thank helps. Thank you for asking that question, Kate. Okay. <laughs> we are going to go to Tara, and then we'll um, head back over to Phil. Okay, I'll say thank you too. I was about to ask something kind of related, but um, tied to that, could you talk a little bit about what your scientists are actually doing in the labs? Um, are they working with test tubes? Are they? Did they actually get samples of coronavirus mm -hmm. from someone who was infected? How, how did they do this? Happy to. So, um, so our scientists are doing a number of things right now. Um, there has been receipt of the virus um, in one of our laboratories, and they're currently culturing, um, growing that virus so that we can have stocks available for a number of things to test products with. It's, um, they're also doing um, characterization of the virus to try to understand, <coughs> learn more of what we know about the virus and how the virus um, impacts um, our, the host and our immune response to that virus. The scientists in our other subordinate laboratories are, yes, test tubes, pipettes. <laughs> they're dealing with mice. They're, they're running um, cell cultures, and, and I can let mm -hmm. the scientists here that are doing the hands-on work talk a little bit <laughs> yeah. more good. So one, one, about that One description, well. and the laboratory that received the samples that uh, uh, Colonel Sammons Jackson was talking about is uh, the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases at Fort Detrick. But if you think of the movie Outbreak and the suits that they wore and the highly contagious environment, without all of the drama of the movie, certainly, but um, that capability certainly exists uh, within uh, military medicine. Um, and uh, that particular laboratory is the DOD's only biosafety level four laboratory. So that type of work, and we're not there yet with coronavirus where we would actually uh, bring it into uh, containment facilities or laboratory suites to test it um, at higher levels. Uh, we mentioned uh, small animals, uh, that would be an advancement to a larger uh, specimen perhaps. Um, not there yet, but uh, that's what the laboratory work looks like, and I think we're actually mm -hmm. conducting uh, that to some degree now mm -hmm. in BSL-3 conditions, uh, biosafety uh, level 2 conditions. But that's uh, to get a picture of what that looks like at uh, low-scale levels, in vitro, under microscopes, um, to all the way to where we would actually begin advanced uh, types of testing there. That's where, uh, that's where we're skating to, if you will. Yeah, so um, MRDC is for Medical Research Development Command is really <coughs> fortunate because we have a very unique national asset, as uh, the general mentioned, in our Institute for Biosafety Level 3, which this current virus um, is required to be um, handled within, as well as Biosafety Level 4. Um, and so those scientists are a critical asset, and those scientists are actively working to um, investigate this, the virus as well. In addition, we also have um, the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research with our two scientists here over here who are working in um, biosafety level two um, and doing the discovery, the small animal work, um, and have some of the most brilliant minds in the world working <coughs> in infectious disease research. And so within that, um, we have a, a very robust science and technology platform 
Um, in addition, we also have um, the capabilities to take products from the science, from, from the um, prototype level, and move them into advanced development, mm -hmm. um, which is required in order for us to move them into manufacturing and commercialization. Yeah. So within MRDC as a whole, we have sort of the <coughs> entire pipeline for developing products. And just super quick follow-up, mm -hmm. where did the sample come from, uh, the coronavirus sample you're working on? The CDC. Okay, but there's no geographic area that can be identified of where the infection was. Was it from China? You know, did it come from China or? No. It came from a U.S. patient. Yeah, I think it was Washington State, but we, you know, we didn't, yeah. It, it came it's from definitely the domestic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's go and get some more questions in here. So let's go to Phil. Um, so just to get uh, clarify really quick on the rapid diagnostic that Lita asked about, what, what first of all, like, you said, uh, if I was clear, you said it'd be about a month or two months before you think such a, a diagnostic would exist? No, no, I, I was saying that, that, that industry right now is taking their s very robust platforms they have been using for a long time to do high throughput screening for other infectious diseases and are adapting those for the testing for the, for the SARS coronavirus too. Um, the point of care tests, if they're going to be actually detecting the virus itself, that becomes, I mean, that's a lot trickier to actually take that sort of, that, that kind of technology and then make it really small. So I will tell you that we ourselves are not involved directly in those efforts. We're becoming aware of those that are because historically we've made so many um, um, kinds of, of research projects along with industry to advance point of care tests largely for infections like HIV because we're heavily involved in the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which obviously the, the, you know, the point of care there are places that are resource constrained in Africa largely. And so you really need those kinds of robust tests that require very, very little skill. I could probably teach my cat to, one, to, to, to use one. That's the sort of test you want to be able to use in the field. It's the same mindset we use in the, in the military to be able to have those in rucksacks, right? So those, that technology, I, 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 I don't want to leave you the impression that that's going to be available anytime soon. Clearly, what we're, fo we're focused on is the more complex laboratories so that we don't have state and local uh, departments of public health that are simply overwhelmed with individuals that want to get tested. So, you had that, so in, in those situations where the patients are coming to a central place, they're having the high throughput test makes sense. If now you're talking about distributing people that want to go detect in less dense populations, that's where the rapid or point of care test will be important. So, so then are you preparing yourselves for the possibility that the military is going to have to test military patients? I mean, it's large, a very large community. Mm -hmm. And when you think about all the people around the world, you know, it's right. unlikely that the civilian capacity would necessarily be there for right. everyone as fast as they need it. Absolutely. What, does that, what does that look like? I mean, like right now, my understanding mm -hmm. is there's only a, a small number of kits that have been distributed to a very specialized, about a dozen or mm -hmm. so labs. So what, is it, what does that look like uh, when you're talking about mm -hmm. getting ready for testing over a million people maybe potentially in the U.S. military? So the goal, and there's multiple approaches. So the goal is just increased capacity. And as Dr. Michael mentioned, um, one way to do that is to develop these high throughput assays and place them in regional, critically strategic regional areas so that we can increase the throughput of the diagnosis. Another approach, as was mentioned before with the point of care, is actually reaching further out into the environment to be able to test and rapidly as an initial screen um, for folks to kind of help understand what the epidemiology is. And so there's multiple approaches within the Army, across the DOD, and in, across the U.S. government as well. Certainly critical in all, each one of those approaches is our industry partners mm -hmm. in this to, to be able to take um, a product and develop it and commercialize it. So we are working with a number of partners um, and providing the support within the laboratories to help develop those yeah. capabilities. Okay, so let's go to Lucas and then we'll hit Courtney in back. Right. And then Lucas Courtney. Tomlinson, Fox News. In your modeling, how many U.S. military service members do you think are going to contract the coronavirus? That, that'd be speculative, sir. Uh, not, uh, I, I don't think we uh, have done any estimates on that. Uh, it would depend on the spread, certainly, uh, the way it's progressing now, but uh, right now, uh, unless... Uh, well, yeah, I mean, we're, I, I think I mean, that's, the, the general's 100% yeah. right. We, we don't have any data um, right now, but where we're beginning to work with partners, that, that Dr. Majar can get a little bit more into that, 
There are lots of people now that have gotten pretty sophisticated by trying to model infectious disease outbreaks. Um, you know, regrettably, because one seems to come, you know, every year or so, we're getting very good at this. Um, the problem with, with the models, it's as only as good as, as the data you have that would build into it, right? So I would just say that, that, that we're beginning to set ourselves up with really good modeling groups to be able to ask questions in areas of the world where it's, the virus is already spreading very quickly, and we have good epidemiology data that would allow us to inform those models. That's going to give us some prediction. Um, but I can tell you during the Ebola outbreak, I literally sat in a WHO meeting and had one modeler talk about when the epidemic in Liberia was going to peak. And essentially, I looked at the numbers, I said, you're basically saying that it's only going to peak when every single human being in Liberia is infected. And he basically just shrugged. So you just need to be careful that these models sometimes can really look bombastic. Um, and they're only as good as the data that initially goes into them. One, one thing I can say is that the current assay, which is a test, um, I think the throughput is uh, around 60 patients uh, every eight hours. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at volumes or what we are trying to develop in the area of detection, um, our goal is uh, anywhere from 275 to 500 every eight hours. Mm -hmm. So if we can increase the throughput for this, and you're talking about a large number uh, that would be affected, uh, take the military for example, we're certainly uh, developing things uh, in case that were to happen. That goes for any, any population. Okay, so I want to go. Um, I, was say something. Yeah. I, I, I would just add, so I think General Talley is correct in that um, any kind of numbers, specific numbers you throw out there are speculative. However, we have epidemiologists at our institute working with others, modelers who do this all the time in the Defense Threats Reduction Agency, DITRA who provide responses to the requests mm -hmm. of all the different geographic combatant commands. And we have been working with them for the past few weeks, initially based on assumptions, but now, more importantly, on real life data. So we're trying <coughs> to refine those models better based on the data that we feed into them. So this is something that we're working on, but I wouldn't speculate and give you specific numbers. Um, what is the earliest that a vaccine would be ready for a U.S. military service member? So, uh, again, it, it depends on what you're talking about in terms of ready. Mm -hmm. um, so, as I said, there's um, we, when we go into phase one clinical trials when, that we have done in the past, we, the volunteers who are involved in those trials are a mix of civilian and <laughs> active duty populations. Um, and then uh, as you go further on, uh, there is in discussions with our partners and our military treatment facilities the potential to have them involved in clinical <coughs> trials. As far as licensure, whether you're talking about emergency use authorization or full licensure, the, if, you, if you talk about vaccines in general, I think Dr. Fauci's remarks that he's um, stated over mm -hmm. and over again are, are really the, the, the benchmark that we should use as the most accurate as being the earliest, 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 probably 12 to 18 months to get something out to the populations. And that would be whether it be civilian or military population. And just recognize that part of that hesitation, I mean, the science can go very quickly, mm -hmm. but you at first don't want to do harm, right? And, you know, there's obviously there are, you know, vaccines can, can cause harm um, and they provide benefits. So that mixture is something you always have to look at. Um, and so, so part of the hesitation to say, oh, we can get a vaccine quickly is you need to make sure that it's really safe. If you test the vaccine in a thousand people, but one in 10,000 people is going to have something terrible that happens until you get to those numbers, you may end up doing mass vaccination campaigns with a vaccine that could cause a significant amount of problems. So you, you, this needs to be a constant reassessment of the risk and the benefit. Um, the other thing I would tell you, and this is a really good benchmark, we were the first people that tested the vaccine that eventually got licensed by Merck to, to, um, for, for Ebola, okay? That vaccine was first tested by the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. Five years later, it was approved by the US FDA. In the meantime, a half a million souls were vaccinated with it largely in Africa, during, especially during the outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So, you know, again, that was a risk-benefit assessment. The, the leadership in the DRC said, 
okay, we know it's not approved yet by European medicines um, uh, or by the US FDA, but we have a terrible outbreak of Ebola, which is highly fatal. And so decisions were made to use that under um, emergency use authorizations. Yeah. And so, you know, there's always that kind of debate, but just, I think that's a good a benchmark for vaccines. Uh, let me also say that we haven't really talked much about this. We are beginning to make other countermeasures. Um, one of those are monoclonal antibodies. So antibodies are part of our immune response. You, you know, it's part of the way the body tries to push infections back. But we can actually make these um, in, in test tubes, and these are becoming a much more common tool that are being used, especially in the fields of oncology, but increasingly in infectious disease. So instead of actually waiting for a vaccine to be made, giving you that vaccine and waiting the time it takes for it to, to, to develop the immune response, you can give with these kinds of reagents, you can give almost immediate protection. So we're literally in the process now of, of beginning to take those first baby steps, as well as looking at, at we talked about um, one drug, the general talked about that one drug that's uh, currently being repurposed and has been looked at for Ebola and now is being looked at for, um, for COVID-2. But there are other small molecules that could be discovered and one, cap one capability that we have at our institute is every malaria drug that's ever been discovered is at some level gone through the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. But we have a really good drug discovery program and so we're looking for other kinds of drugs that might be lead candidates in partnerships with the pharmaceutical um, industry that we could bring those to bear. So vaccines, monoclonal antibodies, and small molecules, drugs that could be brought to bear. So we don't have one, um, one theme in play. We have actually a, a number of themes in play, and all these are being coordinated very closely with our partners, either in government um, or in academia or in industry. So thank you, sir. I, I want to try to get a little bit more mm -hmm. questions out there. So, Courtney, we'll go to you. I want to ask a couple of clarifications. So when you're saying that there's testing going on in mice, mice Dr. Majard, you mean you're not saying that they're being injected with the coronavirus and that, right? Okay, I just wanted to be sure of that. I'm just just, just injected with the vaccine candidates, right. those to options. They re the how, bodies to see how the immune response, um, yeah, to see how it responds to the vaccine, not the virus. Okay, good. I just wanted to be sure of yeah. that. Um, and then um, I, I was a little unclear, Dr. Michael, when you were talking about uh, uh, you were talking about potentially rolling something out the next time that uh, the next season, which I would assume would be fall, winter, or maybe it was you, Dr. Majar, forgive me, yeah. of the next season. But I don't quite understand what that was okay. you were hoping okay. to rolling out. So you know that's a really important question too. Um, was it was there a third? Uh, the third one was just about the production, but keep going. Okay. Yeah, I think you kind of answered the other one, so if you okay. could do those two, that'd be great. So, so, so this is a respiratory virus, and they're, they always give us trouble, you know, during cold weather, um, for obvious reasons, we're all inside, and, you know, windows are closed, et cetera. So, so we typically call that the influenza or the flu season. Our, our expectations that this virus, like every respiratory virus, is going to be less troublesome for us as the weather warms up, and that's going to be true across the globe. But our experience and most of our experience comes from influenza, right, which is sort of the, you know, the, the unfortunately the king of respiratory uh, viruses. But we, but we know a lot about that. And our experience there is that every flu season equals, you know, when the weather gets cold again, this is when these viruses tend to come back. So um, this is why it's really important to understand that a lot of what we're doing now is really getting ourselves ready for what we're calling the second wave of this. We hope that that doesn't happen. If you remember SARS, SARS came and went very quickly. And, um, you know, I, I really hope that happens again, but we, um, we can't count on that. We have to be ready that, that even if this epidemic begins to wane, we have to be ready for next, um, next winter when it may come back again. I'm sorry, I'm still don't understand what it was that you were hoping to roll out with the next wave. Oh, so, so, so we're saying that as, as we begin to, to develop any of these countermeasures we're talking about, monoclonal antibodies, drugs, vaccines, that even if this disease abates over the next few months, we're cons very concerned that it will come back, and it may come back, you know, um, again in the next flu season. If that's the case, then in the meantime, we've been working steadily on these countermeasures so that they'll be ready if there's a next time. Thank okay, you. Okay, solicit mm -hmm. Carl. Did you uh, thank you. Uh, I also just have a couple clarifications, so hopefully this will go quick, but following up with her, just to reiterate, so you're testing in small animals, mice now, you're testing the candidate, and then you had said something about um, the second phase was looking at large populations of mice, would that be 
would that, I mean large populations of mice or would that be of something else that you said that um, thinking about this next phase in the winter I'm not quite okay. sure okay. what's yeah. going on uh, so I'm just going to break it down again mm -hmm. in terms of what are the general phases of vaccine development uh, first you decide down at the atomic level what your vaccine is going to be you know you and then you, you get have your best guess and you have a few different options as to what that will be then you test all those different options in mice meaning testing give them the vaccine and see what kind of immune response they have then typically you go into larger animals like monkeys okay that's typically the case whether we this is a new virus we don't know which one of these animals is the most relevant one to humans. You know, mice are mice. Mice are not humans, right? Monkeys may be a cl little closer to humans. And then you go into humans, and when you go into humans in that first phase, you're just, again, looking at the safety of your vaccine and the immune response. You're not looking at mm -hmm. if it's effective, again, to protect you from the virus. The next phase is where you look at larger numbers of people for safety and immune response again, because the first phase in humans is just a few dozen people. Now we're talking hundreds to thousands. And you start looking at, is it protecting against infection? And you need to have large numbers of infections going on to be able to know whether or not it's protecting against that. So that's why we anticipate, potentially, if there's a second wave, we got to be ready, make it all the way through those first studies <coughs> in the animals and the safety and the immune response, so we're ready and positioned and ready to go if this comes back and there are a bunch of infections so we can know, is it protecting? planning to be at that second phase of humans by next winter just that's where you are okay just wanted to clarify that and then the other thing I wanted to clarify is you said you had a candidate that was complimentary but uh, not duplicative um, what exactly is the candidate I know you talked about the spokes are you you two focusing on the spoke of the of the virus mm -hmm. yes so we you're, are. but that's just what NIH is also working on so everybody's mm -hmm. working on the spoke right now just different Different ways, different parts of the of the spoke, or different versions mm -hmm. of it, and then different ways to express it. Uh, so, uh, as I said, there's different ways. So there's a DNA platform we can express it. There's the mRNA that Moderna is doing with the NIH. They are just using the protein itself. They're using it, up, putting it on a nanoparticle um, protein. So there's different versions of the vaccine and different ways to present it yeah. to the immune system. Okay, so I know we're, we're at 10 after right now, so we'll hit Haley and we're probably going to wrap it up, sir, if you get it. So Haley, go Thank ahead. you, and thank you all for uh, doing this. Um, one question for you, General Talley. Um, last year in the fall, Fort Detrick, the Research Institute, um, had to pause testing for some safety concerns. Can you go into what has been um, done since then to sort of make that a non-issue? Yeah. Um, and then is also, um, I know that Rare has gone over, um, you said, different SARS and this, for different strains of this. What makes this different from the previous mm -hmm. strains that you've been looking mm -hmm. at? Um, and how have you kind of noticed those differences and, and how that will affect the vaccine that you're developing? Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the question. Um, yes, so uh, uh, United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, and that's the, uh, the BSL-4, uh, Biosafety Level 4 lab that I, that I mentioned. But um, uh, on the 18th of July of, of 2019, they were issued a cease and desist order by the CDC, uh, violations uh, because of uh, uh, improper practices, um, all resulting from a number of uh, structural defects. Uh, they developed workarounds that uh, just, just uh, were not safe. There was never any, uh, any danger of risk to the community um, or, uh, or breaking the containment, which is what the labs are for. Um, since then, uh, proud to say, uh, worked uh, very hard to uh, come back and meet CDC regulatory standards. The CDC came back for a reinspection. Um, after a, uh, about a 90-day plan of action and milestones, uh, very aggressively uh, went after that. 
and uh, the CDC restored uh, the laboratory to a limited operational capability, limited in that uh, the same volume uh, that the laboratory uh, had been become accustomed to uh, uh, throughputting, uh, much, uh, much smaller levels, and then certain types of testing. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, BSL-4 being the highest type, uh, Biosafety Laboratory 4 being the highest level. Um, not to that level, but uh, uh, probably a, a, a smaller level or a, a level just shy of that uh, where the, the most dangerous procedures weren't being done. This, is, was, this was in an effort to begin a gradual stand-up of capabilities after being down for so long. Um, the CDC came back um, two weeks ago, uh, uh, first uh, two weeks, uh, actually three weeks ago now uh, in February, came back for a second inspection. This inspection was to allow even more capabilities, more capacity to be performed. Uh, again, proud to say uh, night and day difference uh, according to the CDC, and we were issued uh, a letter to restore even uh, higher level capabilities. Uh, that letter was issued to us uh, just this past Friday. Um, and so with respect to coronavirus, and coronavirus is not considered a, uh, a, a safety level uh, type, of, uh, type of virus that, uh, that, that, that falls into the same category as some of the other higher types. So uh, we have full authorization to perform at the highest levels of scientific capacity at the laboratory for coronavirus. Um, other types of uh, diseases uh, that uh, might meet uh, some of the CDC's criteria uh, still uh, having a gradual return to full operations, but with uh, coronavirus, um, we are going to be able to um, conduct laboratory <coughs> research at the highest levels that the laboratory can, uh, can, can perform. So that's kind of where we are. Uh, real proud. Uh, it's been a work in progress. Uh, we took advantage of the operational pause, if you will, to, uh, to really uh, refine our standard operating procedures. And uh, frankly, the, the complete culture has changed at that institution. And uh, they're, uh, they're back. And um, certainly with coronavirus, um, it's uh, amazing to watch uh, the entire uh, enterprise mobilize the way they have. Thank you. Okay, so she had a follow-up first okay, sorry. on SARS. So uh, regarding your second question about how this virus differs from others and what we've learned, um, probably uh, everybody's familiar now of some of the, that there are seven human coronaviruses that we know of and that the highly pathogenic ones, the ones that tend to kill, are uh, SARS-1, uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, and then the current coronavirus. And so we have been working on um, those other very uh, more dangerous and deadly viruses like MERS and the first SARS. What we've learned um, is really at the very basic atomic level. When I mentioned that we first look at the atomic level of these spokes, these spikes, that's where we've been focusing on because that's the kind, that's where um, the differences matter the most in terms of um, what kind of immune response you get to it, how efficiently it attaches to mm -hmm. the cells in your lung. And one of our chief scientists, Dr. Gordon Joyce, has been doing a lot of the work on that in determining the structures in collaboration, again, with our partners at the NIH, National Institutes of Health, the Vaccine Research Center. So Dr. Joyce, myself, we both came from the Vaccine Research Center, and working with Dr. Graham and Dr. Kizmikia Corbett under Dr. John Mascola, and then one of the other structures that came out is Dr. Jason McClellan at the University of Texas at Austin. We've all, this should give you an idea also how this is a very tight-knit family. <laughs> We're kind of spread across different centers but we talk to each other all the time because we have that very close <coughs> public health and scientific community. Mm -hmm. So um, there are similarities um, between this virus and some of these other viruses, but there are obviously very key differences between MERS and this SARS-CoV-2. There's about 50% difference in the sequence. With SARS-1, there's about 20% difference, but that 20% that matters obviously yes. quite a bit. And so that's the kind of 
um, studying that we've been doing when we first got those sequences and the world got those sequences back on January 10th, we started looking down at the atomic level as to how they differ. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I know we've been going for a little bit, so I want to be able to wrap this up. Um, sir, and we're going to have folks standing by to do the follow-on questions, but, sir, if you want to do closing remarks. Um, well, one last report. Um, since there won't be a vaccine ready in time for this cycle of coronavirus, could you please give your best advice to the the force and the public in general mm -hmm. about how to kind of ride this out for now? Well, I... You know, it really is, I mean, we, we are literally living in uh, influenza season. Uh, people are getting infected and dying of this disease. I like to remind people that during the Ebola outbreak, both the one that just happened in the Democratic Repo uh, Republic of Congo and in West Africa, you know, somewhere between 16 to 19,000 people were still dying every week of HIV infection. So, you know, the, the, the public, the medical communities, governments were really gotten very good at managing how we deal with the scourges of infectious disease. So like any respiratory virus, you know, we're going to be getting ourselves into the habit of washing our hands much more frequently. If, you, if there's one thing that you can do, it's wash your hands much more frequently, right? So I mean, we're, we're both clinicians as well. When you go into the hospital, a nurse will wrap you on the, on the knuckles if you don't wash your hands coming into the room or coming out, even if you don't touch anything. So that's critical. The, the, the things that we already know how to do, we do social distancing, you know, we're not gonna be doing a lot of hugging and kissing. If people are sick, they should stay home. If they're, you know, if they really are, are very, very ill, then they can go into the hospital. So, um, but hospitals now are, are getting very good about, about, you know, how they would approach making sure that they can protect their staff as well as protecting other patients from someone who might be a risk. So, you know, I think people should, should recognize at the end of the day, this still remains a low risk um, infection to not just our service members, but to the American uh, public, and that we are really good as a hospital system, as a medical care system, um, from both the EMT up to in intensive care units at taking care of these. I'm not minimizing it. I'm just saying that even in the absence of a vaccine, we still don't have a, a vaccine for HIV infection, but we have very good drugs, and we're beginning to develop monoclonal antibodies. So, you know, we will continue to, to campaign against these infectious disease threats as we would um, against enemies against the homeland. And we're, we're, we're good at doing those sorts of things. But the American public should be reassured that, that this is a threat that we're used to from, from the standpoint of influenza. We are working on developing measures, but everyone can assist just by washing their hands. Uh, well, I, I hope, uh, hopefully you've been able to hear that uh, you know, when you're talking to the different agencies, that are out there and you're getting different responses for what they're doing individually. This is uh, truly a whole of government approach. So certainly if, if one, uh, one agency, one organization, if it's an industry partner, if it's academia, um, I think we're well nested and we're sharing information and collaborating so that um, we're able to leverage uh, the right resources uh, to bring a vaccination uh, or a vaccine candidate as, we, as we've learned about today across the finish line. So um, we're going to continue to uh, collaborate in the fashion that we, that we have, and um, uh, we're going to work as hard as we can to find uh, the right treatments, the right preventative measures, and, um, and certainly the right detection capabilities that are out there. Those are our three focus areas within, uh, within the DOD. Um, we really appreciate your time today, and um, uh, again, uh, thank you very much. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Okay, so everybody, thanks for coming today. So we have some folks that are going to stand by in this room to do follow-up questions for you. Lori Salvatore um, from the lab is here with her team, and then we also got my team here from ACFA that can help facilitate follow-on questions that we didn't get to that you want for your reports. And then I just want to thank General Talley and his team for their time today. So thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.